Danielle Sosson, is that correct? Sosson. Sosson mm -hmm. from Duluth, Minnesota. She's been writing fiction, uh, started writing in the late 1980s through classes at the Loft Literary Center in uh, Minneapolis. She's going to speak about and read from her new novel, The Long Shining Water, that's the result of extensive research on Lake Superior and its history. Her book's available for signing and purchase uh, over here after she speaks. Um, we have a, uh, a copy of it here in the library. We have one copy that we didn't quite get out yet. I started reading it. I want one of your books tonight. I must have one of your books tonight. I highly recommend that you get a hold of one of these copies before you leave tonight. It grabbed me and then it was taken away and I was devastated. So, uh, I'm looking forward to you. Please welcome Danielle. Thank you, Ken. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Tom. The um, River of History Museum is co-sponsoring this event tonight. Susan and Tom did a lot of work to make it happen. I'm happy to be here. And thank you, Mark, for the beautiful reading. It was very fun to watch somebody else do it. <laughs> so I've been doing it a lot lately. Um, and you were right when you said that it's a book about Lake Superior. It is set on Lake Superior, but it is about the lake. Um, the novel's called The Long Shining Waters, and uh, I'm just gonna talk a little bit about it and then read from it. Um, uh, the book is um, my attempt to explore the question, what is it about Lake Superior that makes it so haunting and so mysterious and so powerful? It is not like any other body of water I've ever spent time on. Um, and I've been <laughs> to a lot of places. It has a very singular feel to it, um, which I call juju for lack of a better word. Um, the, the idea that I ended up working with in the book is that Lake Superior is holding its history, which of course you all know it is literally, there's a ton of stuff down there. It's similar to what Mark was talking about, the layering of time. Um, the idea that everything that's happened on and around the lake is just held there in the waters. And that, that affects those of us who live on its shores. So there are three storylines set in the book, and they're set in different time periods. There's a story set in 1622, which is an Ojibwe story that's set on this end of the lake. Um, there's a story set in 1902 that's on the North Shore in Minnesota, calls its shore the North Shore. Obviously, Canada's the North Shore. Not quite sure how that happened. It's really the West Shore over there, but uh, we call it the North Shore. Um, and then there's a story set in the year 2000 um, that is set in Superior, Wisconsin. Um, that story, the main character is a woman named Nora Trunot, who runs a bar. If any of you have ever been to the Anchor Bar in Superior, you will recognize Nora's schooner. It's one of these old, divey, maritime bars with nets hanging and greasy glass over the pictures. <laughs> it's, a great, it's a great bar. <laughs> um, but if you take to heart this, this idea that the lake is holding its history, um, what happens is that time becomes simultaneous. It's all held there at once. It's not linear anymore. So as in Mark's poem where he was talking about the boats and the canoe paddles and the, that sense of it all being there is the way the lake is for me. And it's um, what I'm doing in this book. Um, I pictured it um, pretty early on. Everybody here looks old enough. Maybe not you, to remember mm -hmm. overhead projectors. <laughs> <laughs> you do? Um, so I pictured it, um, here's a transparency. The first story, the main character in the story set in 1622 is a young um, Ojibwe mother named Grey Rabbit. Um, and so here's Grey Rabbit in the lake and a tree and, a, and then I would take the story in 1902. It's a fishing couple 
Barrett and Gunnar, um, who are Norwegian. He's an immigrant. She grew up in the Keweenaw. Um, so here's Grey Rabbit's story, and here's Barrett and Gunnar's story. And then draw a scene from Norse and put it right on top. The thing that's connecting them is the transparency. It's the water. Um, so they're, the stories don't connect in a conventional way. There's no, and nobody ends up being related. There's not a red violin that moves through time. Um, <laughs> it is the power of the lake that is the connecting force. It's the mystery of the lake, which is the mystery that, the same mystery that we all face every day by the fact that we're here, you know. A lot of the book is about um, things that we as humans really only understand at the edges, um, or that we can only intuit really about being here. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to read a little bit from each of the sections. Um, let's see how that goes. I cannot read without glasses anymore. <laughs> I'm kind of bitter about it. But, um, <laughs> I have to have them in all rooms of my house. You know, it's amazing. Even the three for three for cheap at Walgreens, they disappear. Um, but, but such is is cheap. So the first thing I'm going to read is um, from a story set in 1622. Um, so this is Grey Rabbit's story, though this scene is largely um, bullhead. Um, it's set in the winter, and so the family is in a smaller family unit. They're at their hunting grounds, um, and they're struggling against starvation. Their food cache has grown low, and their hunting has been unsuccessful. Um, so you'll, you'll hear the names of all the people in the family, um, but uh, the scene is is Bullheads, the mother-in-law, or the elder of the family. Um, Grey Rabbit is the main character, and she is um, having dreams about um, children in danger that are just increasingly <coughs> disturbing her life. Um, her husband is Night Cloud, and they have two kids, um, a young man named Standing Bird and a little guy named Little Cedar who is uh, still too young to fast, which is relevant to the scene. So this is um, Bullhead in 1622. The river splits around a black rock with a white cap of snow before sliding back under the ice and over the little waterfall. Bullhead squats to rest for a moment near the small stretch of open water. There are two bubbling lines streaming out from the rock in a pattern the shape of flying geese. Walking up from the big water has tired her. She had hacked a hole in the ice at a place that felt right, but there, as in her usual spots, the net had come up dripping and empty. Fish, her mouth waters, trout, salmon, white fish, herring, cooking on sticks near a crackling fire. She would turn them slowly until they were done just right. For two days, they'd eaten soup cooked from pieces of hide, lichen, and the stringy inner layers of bark. Night cloud snared a rabbit, but it was small and shared mostly with little cedar. How proud Bullhead was of Standing Bird as he sat solemnly with his broth, the smell of cooked rabbit thick in the air cramping her own stomach over and over with a desire more insistent than any passion she'd known. A wind moves through the pines and they toss and creak, dropping small bits of snow to the ground. Little cedar grows vulnerable. She has seen it many times before, the slowed response to what usually excites and the dullness that settles over the eyes like a snake as it begins to molt. She made a decoction of dried ox eye root to give strength to the boy's limbs, but its effect was mild. If only she'd had the root newly pulled, not dried, she could have chewed it and spit the softened bits directly onto his arms and legs. The rock and water make a gurgling music, and the faint light plays in the streaming bubbles. 
Bullhead can hear Grey Rabbit working in the woods, her bone rasping against the high rock wall as she scrapes lichen to add to the soup. How quickly the soup leaves her stomach feeling empty, without even pumpkin blossom left for thickening. Bullhead takes in a long, weary breath. The air smells of old snow and open water. Across the river, the chickadee sits perched on an icy limb. Its feathers are puffed around its body, causing its head to look small. Even the little birds make their own way, not nearly so weak as her kind, who are born without feathers, warm fur, or thick hide. She pulls off her rabbit skin mitt, looks at her fingers, the mean scar on her thumb, Yes, the Anishinaabe were given the power to dream, and yet they are so fragile, so dependent, that they must take the very skins of other animals and wear them over their own to stay warm. The chickadee sits puffed on its limb. The river water is dark, but also light in the places where it carries the color of the clouds. Bullhead follows the movement of the water it slides in smooth sheets, circles and bends, wrinkling in lines that shrink and expand. Constant, constant, constantly changing. Always the river, yet never the same. Slowly, <coughs> the waters claim her, and her thoughts dissolve into the current. Gone is Bullhead, mother of three. Gone daughter, sister clan member, widow. There's just the swift water as it twirls and glides, moves in smooth sheets that carry her downstream. Uh, I'm going to read you the first time as a reader that you come across. Oh, I forgot to talk about. Where did she go? Sorry. Oh, there you are. I forgot to talk about the voice. There's a fourth voice that weaves through the narratives of this book, um, and, it, and they're short, italicized sections. And it's the voice of a character who's lost to the lake. Um, so this voice does, hopefully, what fiction does best, which is takes us places we can't go. It speaks from under the lake. It encounters um, currents of history and um, physical objects down there. Uh, and sort of reports. But it, it's uh, a voice that's on its own journey. It starts in first person, um, and there are particulars of a life um, talked about. And as it journeys, its perspective gets larger and larger and larger until its last entry, which is omniscient. So those who think it's the voice of the lake, there's an argument to be made for that, though I um, wouldn't, what's the word, I wouldn't even try to attempt to put a voice to the lake. <laughs> I'll just say that. Um, so this is the first time as a reader that you come across this voice. From below, the surf churns gray and white. It billows like the bottoms of clouds, creates a sound like rolling barrels or the distant, muffled stampede of hooves. What prickling sensation at the precipitous drops, 100 feet, 200 and more, where the slow-growing fish feed, the herring and the whitefish I once sought, the rising siskelet and the trout, suspended overhead like long, dark shoes, like deeds left undone, the shape of regret. On the lake bed, the sediment rests in layers, gray matter from the north, red from the south, one era's story deposited over the next, and my own story to which I cling, yet all this too is somehow mine. I see the relic surfaces bearing the scour marks of ice. The fine flowing patterns etched in the rock are as my own fingerprints. Dimpled silt, 
the solitary burbot swims. Ringed vibrations surge and rebound, and rivers of mud waves lie in long troughs. Each red clay canyon has its own dark sounding, each cave a pulsating entrance, and the roaming currents carry the whisper of words. Pemitiguea, bon voyage, I try to understand. Um, I'm going to read next from the story set in the year 2000. Um, so this is Nora at the Schooner Bar in Superior, Wisconsin. Uh, this scene is also set in winter. It's the middle of the night, and she's taking down the Christmas decorations in the bar. Um, Nora is a woman in her late 50s, uh, kind of been around the block. Um, she's a mother and a grandmother and a longtime widow. Um, also in this scene, you hear a little bit, um, well, you hear Rose's music, but you don't actually meet Rose. Rose is an older woman who's a regular at the bar who lives in the apartment above Nora. This is Nora in 2000. Nora reaches for the nail that holds the Christmas lights, her breath fogging against the mirror behind the bar when something from her dream takes form, a feeling almost as much as an image, causing an empty swirling inside. She kneels on the bar stool and closes her eyes, hoping her mind might retrieve a scrap. But no, nothing. It's usually like that, just a little sliver of something when she's awake that had been part of something bigger. She moves her stool against the double door cooler, bumping the new calendar that slides down on its magnet. January, again, already. The string of Christmas lights sags low, green, pink, yellow, blue, doubled and swinging in the barroom mirror as she lowers them from the nail. There's something about taking down Christmas decorations that always makes her feel empty. It's like after the movies, when the lights come on, the story's done, and there she is, sitting with her coat in her lap. Sometimes she even gets the feeling at home in the, in the silence of her apartment after the TV twangs off. Nora pulls bottles off the back bar to get at the string of lights taped to the riser. The idea for the riser lights came years before, when her mirror swag fell in the middle of a rush. At the time, she was too busy to care, so she kept on working with the lights back in the bottles, and she grew to like the way they shone through. Pink in the vodka, a warm glow behind the brandy. Well, it can't be Christmas all of the time, and cleaning's the best way she knows to start over. The sharp smell of vinegar rises as it mixes with the steaming tap water. Nora pours herself a vodka, and with timing but second nature, writes the bottle and reaches back, turning off the faucet. Footsteps cross overhead, followed by the sound of a bench scraping across the floor. She smiles as she rings the rag, then wipes the riser with long strokes, her attention on the ceiling, listening. Rose's piano music drops down through the floor, slightly muffled and otherworldly. Angelic, the firm piano chords and the tinkly upper notes, the softest, sweetest sounds come from that tough old girl. Nora hums and eyes the ornaments as she wipes the bottles and stands them back in place. The ornaments are everywhere, hooked into the netting that drapes from the ceiling with the glass floats and the corks and the life preservers hung from the rigging of the model schooner that's displayed on its own shelf by the pool table. All around her, pieces of her history are dangling from thin threads. Nora swishes her rag in the bucket of water, rings it, and wipes down the bottle of crown. The Indian girl with a papoose was a gift from Delilah, their best cook in the boom days before the mines shut down. Those years were nearly fatal for the towns on the Iron Range. 
Superior got plenty bruised as well with its railroad and shipping industry. But she's not complaining. She's been luckier than most. The last thing to belly up in any town are its bars. <coughs> well, its churches too. She dumps the old water into the sink. A waltz. The piano music feels just right as Nora pushes a chair around the floor, climbing up and down to get the ornaments from the nets. She unhooks the log cabin that Ralph, her late husband, made entirely of whittled sticks. Together for seven years, married for three, the cabin twirls in a circle from an old piece of leather. That's 24 years she's run the bar on her own. She climbs down and sets the ornaments on a table, the silver angels holding hands like paper dolls, the elf on the pine cone from her sister Joni in California, reminding her that she needs to mail a birthday gift, the old rusty red caboose. She'll wrap them each in tissue paper and tuck them snugly in a box like little children off to sleep. The music stops abruptly. The bench scrapes out. The sky through the window is tinted orange from the glow of the neon lining kugel sign. Nora opens the door to the empty street and the steely smell of winter coming in from the ore docks. It's snowing again, tiny flakes like salt dropping through the streetlight halos. There's not even a car to be seen not a single black track on the street's white surface. The tiny flakes drop down from the blankness, landing on her sweater and the toes of her shoes. The chimney on the VFW is a silhouette against the sky. There was something in her dream. She's carried it all day. Nora feels the cold air reach her lungs, feels that particular time of night where it seems like she's the only one awake, the only witness to the snowy street, to the air blowing in from the frozen harbor, and the small falling flakes that are touching everything. That's a little Nora. I'm gonna read you um, another from the voice that's speaking from the water. I see corralled logs, a giant wooden rug rolling slowly overhead. And the many scattered timbers, they waterlog and sink on the long journey across the Great Lake. Cedar, red birch, birds on maple, hemlock, red oak, the pine and the fir, Voices stream on the currents. Men at work in the woods, the undercutters, the swampers, the crosscut saw teams. Comes a whinnying horse, the ring of an ax, and a tree ridded for half a millennium falls. From east to west in 50 odd years, the sky opens, the winds sweep in. I find logs in jumbles like broken down cabins each marked with the timber stamps of the men who staked claim. They lay at the bottom of pitch black valleys, appear as ridges beneath the silt. This one lies on a ledge of bedrock, swept clean by an underwater current, a slumbering giant, femur of a god, a sharp flint lodged in its side. And then his dark shape, it slips over the ledge, his pale hand trailing like a falling star. So the story said in 1902, um, the main characters are Barrett and Gunnar, um, who I talked about a little bit. You also meet uh, in this scene or hear about a man named John Running Horse who's an Ojibwe man who's a hunter um, and trapper, and he and Gunnar have befriended each other. Um, as people did who fished there when the winter got to the point where you couldn't get out in your boat anymore, um, either left 
or you try to find some other kind of work to sustain yourself. Um, and in this scene, Gunnar is returning from the lumber camps where he's been working for a couple of weeks. Um, also relevant to the scene is that um, Barrett and Gunnar have a childless marriage, and it's been an issue for them. So this is Gunnar in 1902. Gunnar straps on his skis, then hoists his pack. The warmer days are turning the snow wet and heavy, so the more distance he can cover before the sun rises, the better. He's no stranger to the hour before night gives way to day, as he's up and rowing to his nets, as soon as the sky holds enough light to navigate. Sure, it's not exactly the same in the woods. <coughs> woods cling to darkness longer than water. He winds the scarf bare knit around his face, straps his poles on his wrists, and shoves off. For a time, he can follow the cuts of the logging sleighs, its snow-covered width discernible in the dark. The grade is downhill, so he uses his edges, slowing to avoid scraps of bark that are large enough to throw him over. It's likely John got the rabbits to his missus. He can feel her on the other end of his journey, and he'd love to let loose and ski at full steam but he has to keep from working up too much of a sweat. If the temperature drops suddenly, it'll freeze on him. The woods are quiet, except for the swish of his skis and the wool to wool of his pant legs. The lake isn't visible, but its icy smell is in the air. He can feel it below like a sleeping animal, breathing its dark, watery breath. That was quite a story that John had told him. A giant, 20 miles long and turned to stone, lying face up in the lake. He couldn't quite follow the whole tale or tell whether this Manabuju was a man or a god. Maybe he was some type of Indian troll, human-like, shape-shifting. In Aunt Doherty's stories back home, trolls often turn to stone. John could have made the yarn up to distract him after his own grim tale but that didn't seem to be the case. He told it like it was true. It would be something to see, this Nanabuju, a sleeping giant in the lake. The sleigh cut looks like a gray floor laid along the bottom of a dark cave. No sign yet of the dawn. Gunnar loosens his scarf, already warming as he pulls up an incline. It was good of John to hear out his story. Not that he feels much better for the telling. Not that it changes what he'd done. He reaches the top of the hill and takes the slope down, gliding past the indiscernible woods, keeping to the gray trail, as that day, indelibly set in his mind, unfolds before him in the darkness. It was a fresh pine morning with rippling dark breakers the lake still billowing from a two-day northwester, and he was worried about his catch. The northwesterly wind was still blowing, strong enough to keep him from getting back to land. It finally let up late morning, and so he launched his skiff into the lake. He rowed straight-lined away from shore, practically feeling Baird's thick silence as she watched him through the window pane. They'd fought. Sure, well, not exactly. A small quip the night before, and no words exchanged come morning. It was a pattern that had grown too familiar. Too many things had grown in place of children. The first stiffness left his shoulders as he worked the oars, his course taking him over familiar lake bottom, the basalt table that continues off his cove, with its high spot that he has to skirt, and the group of mammoth boulders, then the scattered few that are visible only when the lake lies flat, at five fathoms, still visible at seven, before the bottom drops away. The air was crystal and sharp, smelling of pine pitch and rot, and the seagulls were crying loops in the air, following in hope of easy food. He positioned himself first by pine and stone face, 
then by the shapes of the familiar ridges. As he rode, the land transformed itself as always, from a stagnant footing, solid with home and wife, to an abstraction of shape and texture, a tool for navigation, and a goal that meant safety if the weather were to turn. He was hoping there'd been no damage to his game, though the herring should be fine if he could get them in soon. At the top of a swell, he spotted the red claw fastened to his uphauler. Then down he went into a trough where there was nothing to see but water and sky. The swells were too big to bring her in standing, so he waited for the lake to lift him again, adjusted his course, and rowed on. The gulls settled on the dark blue water, paddling back and forth, watching him work his ropes. You best forget about it, he addressed the flock. I'll not be tossing any storm herring today. One more day of weather, and the fish would have been ruined, gone so soft that bones would poke through their flesh when he went to pick them from the nets. Sure, he gets tense when he can't get out. He hadn't meant to speak to her so curtly. He started in at one end of his game, hauling a section of net to the surface, lifting it across his boat, the cold water running from the ropes. One by one, he freed herring from the mesh and dropped them into the bottom of the skiff. They were fine. The catch was fine. Too much time he could spend worrying. When the section of net was cleared of fish, he pulled himself along below it, bringing a new section up and over, then watching the cleared one fall back to the lake, corks up, leads untangled. Everything was rolling and shining and wet as he rode up and down with the swells, the herring at his feet like sickle moons. He worked methodically, choking the fish in one section of net after another, his eyes moving from his task to the water, to the ridges, to the sky, always watching for weather. A gull squawked and shit white in the boat as he started in on a new net. But something was wrong. The net resisted him. Its pull was skewed, and it wouldn't come over the gunnel like it should. And sure, if that net wasn't one of his best, not good, not good at all. He hadn't been able to afford new nets for some time. Maybe if he'd worked more of that year's winter timber, but he couldn't bring himself to leave, not with Barrett so low. He maneuvered himself further along, watching the net as he pulled it from the water, then the cleared side to make sure it sank back right. Could be that the lake had tossed a timber his way. The bulk of the problem was coming right up, there, a couple fathoms below, and it looked like a huge ball of a mess. Almighty, he couldn't afford this. The weight of it was starting to strain, turning him so he was taking the swells at an angle. Then he stopped pulling. It lay below him in the water. A man. There was a man tangled in his net. See what I mean? Mm -hmm. you got to have that book. <laughs> I'm going to read one more short uh, piece from the voice in the lake. I will tell what I've learned about black water. Black water is obsidian gone soft, a liquid image of dark space, where one dark realm opens to another, opens to another, or maybe closes. All manner of depth is at once obscured. It is a dark wool coat, a black serpent scales, quick flash of a copper tail. Can such a thing be anything but furtive, concealing razor sharpness, jut of bone, open mouths? Black water calls for vigilance. Every conceivable bearing is a portal. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> so we have a little more time. Do you want to come up? Does anybody have questions, or do you want to just move? Yeah. You read very. You read very well. You are a theater pe person for sure. I am so not a theater person. <laughs> but but, but this you, you, you speak you speak it well. Thank you. I, it's, it's from my heart, that's why. Yeah. It's practiced. It's practice, practice, practice. Well, that's what I am theater not is, a practice. this is not my natural milieu to be standing in front of people. Not at all. <laughs> um, but I'm getting over it, I'm getting better. And thank you. I, am, I do practice them, I guess, like an actor would, you know, yeah. because it's, it's a um, couple of my other siblings, no problem. I'm one of the two that was, that's kind of like, don't look at me. <laughs> <laughs> now, do you, do you write for, um, like, was this just something out of the blue to write this, or? Um, out of the blue, haha. Uh -huh. <laughs> no, uh, before writing, this is my first novel, before that I have a collection of short stories, um, and I'd written a short story that's basically the end of the story in 1622, which was completely failed. So I was still interested in, in the material. Um, I'm also not one of those writers who just has a million ideas and mm -hmm. not enough time to get them all down. So with short stories, every time I'd finish one, I'd be like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like maybe that's it. <laughs> it was not very comfortable. So I thought <laughs> that writing a long piece would, you know, take me out of having to deal with that. Um, so I was looking for uh, a question that was big enough for me to spend some time trying to answer, which is why it came from the inspiration. I've done a lot of writing on the lake, renting cabins on the shore, just writing, hiking, hanging out. So it was a natural. Um, did you traverse around the lake as well? Pardon? Did you traverse around the lake like Laura did? I did. Um, the woman who runs the bar in Superior has a disaster in her life and she ends up on a completely <coughs> ambivalent trip around the lake. So I did go around the lake once I realized she was going. <laughs> it, was, it was funny because uh, I didn't have much time or money, so I had to go kind of fast. And then we ended up, um, there was sort of a struggle as to how to spend time. Like I would, there were a lot of places where I would have hiked and she's like, no, that bar looks good. Luckily, I don't mind going to bars, so it worked out okay, but you know, it was really, she totally dictated um, how that trip went. So I'm actually looking forward to, I'm on my way around the lake right now, so I'm looking forward to spending more time in Canada and going slower. And, uh, do another lake book, he gave you a title out of the blue. There you go. Right out of the red, depending on its mood. And then, you know, I was kind of curious, when you wrote the book, did you write um, a chapter or a couple, you know, four or five pages at a time, and then go to the next character and write four or five pages at a time, or did you write the whole 1600 story and then break it up? No, I would work on one until I was stuck and didn't know and then go where to go, or until I was too frustrated, and then I'd move to the next one and try and bring it along. And so it was like that. And I had a large, like an eight by six board, and I would print out sections. I started putting them, um, the, they go back and forth in fairly short sections, mm -hmm. not always in the same order. So I started doing that kind of as I was going. It was pretty haphazard. There wasn't a real system. It was sort of dictated it by, like to be difficult by getting by hitting walls is what would dictate <laughs> from, from one to another. Okay. Probably better than just having one thing you're working on and you're stuck and that's it. I would think. <laughs> Thank you, because my next project I'm going to try and write another novel because it's a big learning curve in terms of craft, the difference from short story to long, um, and. 
the challenge is to have it all be one piece, and that's probably what I'm going to run into. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for the red flag. <laughs> Do sections and then put put them together. Yeah, I'll probably jump around. And then, yeah. so Danielle's book is available, and um, we don't have a lot more time. So if you'd like to, we can take your question, Carl, and then if you'd like to purchase our book, I think it would be a great thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and let me tell you too that it's the um, River of History Museum that's selling books, so all your purchases go to a good cause. Mm -hmm. So what you need to do is you need to take a sailing trip on Lake Superior, and Ken would uh, Ken could uh, help you with, with that adventure. And, and so it's an adventure. And I have been across Lake Superior on a, on a yacht race. Wow. So, so I can tell you, there, there are a million ways that you can die. <laughs> <laughs> I believe you. <laughs> on that note, let's <laughs> end. You can die writing poetry and drive. <laughs> 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 <laughs>